I'm over here stroking my dick. I got lotion on my dick right now. I'm just stroking my shit. You know, I watched a show called Smiling Friends, and I usually watch it in one batch. So, I watched the whole season in one go, and there was one episode specifically that really touched me a lot. Which was actually the first episode... They were making a lot of jokes specifically about video games and it really made me, well, <laughs> feel it all over again. Because what they said is true and it's a lot of dick moves. I probably made a video talking about all this a while ago, but I will talk about it once more, just more in a definitive way. The show was showing us an old mascot and the mascot had low graph looking really old style but you know full passionable because it was ugly it wasn't beautiful it barely had any polygons and you know it had this really nice and old appeal like back in playstation 1 games it made me realize something nowadays we have games with a lot of polygons the graphics are top notch and the designing is like 10 out of 10 quote unquote but it really made me realize that all this designing and how they make characters and make sure they're the highest graphic possible made them all look really bland. The joke that they made is a character that looks kind of like Doom Guy, and it made me laugh because I love Doom Guy. It's one of the designs that remained almost entirely the same thing for over 20 years, if not already 30 years. But that's the appeal of it. E specifically, Doom Guy has that appeal because his whole point is not to ever change the design. His design is simple, but its simplicity is really good. That's why people loved it. So when you think about it, I, I then thought about it and, you know, I try to remember all kinds of old mascots that I really enjoy. I personally was a Sony fan and two examples that I have is Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon. They had a lot more appeal back in PlayStation 1 and maybe a bit of PlayStation 2. More than what we have today with the remaster and whatnot. It feels like no matter what, whenever they take these old games, they remaster them, make them quote-unquote better or quote-unquote fixed. It doesn't really fix it because you're losing the magic of what it was back in the day. Now sure, you could say that this is a nostalgic thing. It's a nostalgic feeling and... We just want to feel how it was back in the day, but I don't think that's the case. A lot of times when you look at a game that has lower graphics and in general lower polygons and the game looks, well, quote unquote, shit, then you feel that, hey, I need to use my brain to complete it. I need to use my brain to close gaps of its design. That's how many artists, for example, could probably draw Doom Guy from a simple face or from simple facts like, oh, he's wearing a green shirt. People could use these stuff, use their imagination to build a character that they think is the definitive design of the same character. Something that nowadays you don't really need to because, well, they just design it as a whole. Nowadays, the only thing we need to fill the gaps is getting more money from our job in order to pay for these expensive games that are just not worth the penny most of the time. Now, honestly, it's everybody's choice, whatever they want to buy or not, but come on. There's so many games that nowadays are just so irrelevant because that all they think about is a design race. They want to make the game look as pretty and ultra-realistic as possible. So, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to let you think about an option... There are two games, and both of them have this quote-unquote ultra-realistic style. One of them, for example, is Ghost of Tsushima. It's a great game back in Japan, very good-looking, ultra-realistic graphics. The second one is Red Dead Redemption 2, also, but this time in the Wild West, ultra-realistic in America in the Wild West times. So, I'm gonna ask you something. Which of them do you think actually has a better design overall? Well, that's the thing. When you're going to think about it deeply, most people, I at least think so, are going to say Red Dead Redemption 2. And there's a really simple reason to that. Because the game has taken ultra-realism 
as its main core of design. Its whole point is to make it immersive, realistic, and make you feel like you're part of it. And they're making it as much as they can by making it, making sure it's as emotionally pleasing as possible. While a game like Ghost of Tsushima, although it has ultra-realistic graphics and looks great, it's not an artistic choice. You could look at a game like Ninja Gaiden, which, yeah, it had somewhat of a realistic choice, but you still had these bizarre animations, like huge jumping or attacks that didn't make any sense, and a lot of effects that, hey, you may, it made you feel like, hey, this is an artistic choice. This is a design. So what does Ghost of Tsushima have as an artistic design, quote-unquote? The only real thing I can think about is the pathing. When you're riding a horse, you can do an option where you swipe your controller and it will give you some sort of pathway by the wind blowing and that way you can know where you need to go. This is a great artistic choice, but it's kind of sad that this is the only one. The rest of the things are more historical thoughts. It's more taking things to matter. Well, in Red Dead, it's, it doesn't feel like that. Because the game gives you so many immersion and gives you so much design choices that, hey, Dead Eye is probably the most unrealistic thing out there. But because of its design, it's so vast, it's so large, that it doesn't feel like the only thing you have out of your whole arsenal. It feels like this is only one part of out of the whole batch. The fact that you have that, the fact that everything you do, the game tries to make it more immersive, cinematic, but not in a way that you're watching the movie, not like in Ghost of Tsushima or Horizons or many other games. No, it makes you look at these things because they want you to feel it the same. And at the same time, you also have these bizarre artistic choices that Rockstar had when making Red Dead, like the whole horse part with the balls. I mean, come on. Sure, this is an artistic choice overall. This is a design choice. But in Ghost of Tsushima, you would never see something as close as that. You would never see in the game a way of a person appreciating art. You will never see something like Arthur Morgan drawing on his journal, his whole journey. And you're just amazed by it. Because not only do you see him drawing it with a lot of detail, with a lot of love, but then you get to play as an art character that tries to do the same thing, but he draws it really badly. You could see that he never drew, and it's an artistic choice. It's a thing that he tried to take as an example from Arthur because he's a great friend of his, and tried to do the same because it looks really cool. It's something that really gives him a thoughtful of mind. So how the hell do you do this? How the hell do you make the artistic choices? How do you make the game make you feel like, hey, they're making something here way beyond the basics of the basics. Ghost of Tsushima, for example, I don't see much. The biggest things I thought that were really good is the wind part and the fact that you can go to pretty much hot springs and relax in them. But the problem is that they're all just animation. They're, they never change. They're always the same. And it's just a built world. It's something that you have in the world. And you could see it in a lot of games that Sony publishes. From Ghost of Tsushima, Horizon, Spider-Man. They all have this blind, blind vision to it. It's a bland taste that's fully blinded because they just make sure that the graphics look really good. And the game itself, we don't have to worry about it. The gameplay is going to do its own. But you never feel something artistic to it. That's pretty much my whole thought about it. It's something that I really saw on the whole first episode of Season 2 and Smiling Friends, and I was like, this is exactly what I felt. Especially the fact that they were just laughing at companies, that nowadays they know that everything that matters are DLCs and microtransactions, and really, returning a character back from the old days that it was dead doesn't, doesn't make any sense. They don't need to do it. Why should they do it? My favorite part about it is the fact that at the end of the episode, this character, instead of, you know, having a somewhat of a happy ending, becoming a game of its own and really releasing something, we see a fade that we see right now. 
We see him just becoming a cameo character in a fighting game. It kind of reminds me of multiple games that we've seen. Smash Bros. is a great example. Multiverses is a great example. And heck, even the newest Mortal Kombat is, is also a victim to this part. Because instead of giving you characters that are, hey, they're cool and everything, you're kind of a cameo to it. It's probably the, the next game that's going to be released. You might just never see them because why should you? We just made them because we think this is the best revenue wise nowadays. So why should we care? If we see that the game is not successful, we don't really have a reason to put them again. It's a mindset that happens a lot and it's really sad. I remember playing Mortal Kombat as an example when I was a kid. I enjoyed that they had an artistic choice of motion capturing people, making it into frames and then into sprites. It's an artistic choice. The same as we see in Smiling Friends that you could probably see multiple art choices and it's all because the art style of the same person is what they choose to do. And instead of making a lot of developers and a lot of designers break their leg, break their back, and break their pride from designing something so bland and shit, you should just let them sometimes, you know, go crazy with it. I'm going to say this in all honesty. I feel like at least 70-80% of the most successful games we've seen of all time most of them were artistic mistakes, or not mistakes, but freedom. It wasn't a part that the artist was saying, ah, oh, shit, now if I'm going to put this A, B, C, D, then I'm going to lose stock market share. No. If you're going to think about 20 years ago, they didn't give a shit about that. So why would they? You could see a whole game like GTA Vice City that it's all artistic choice is old Miami neon lights. It's amazing. It's an artistic choice overall. But then you look at games nowadays that they're very bland and they're just feeling dead. You can go in and play it and be like, well, shit, I guess it's time to go play Call of Duty. But then you play the newest one, they're practically the same. There really is no progress when it comes artistically. And it's simply because they just want to get more money. And <laughs> it's something that really upsets me personally because... I can't really tell the difference nowadays. It reminds me that nowadays I also play uh, from time to time a game called Guess the Game. Which, as the name says, every day there's like an, an image, a zoomed in image of a game. And you need to guess what it is. You have around six tries and if you can, you failed. And then it tells you what game you try to guess. There were games, and I do this daily almost... And there were games that I've done that I could not guess them at all because of two reasons, and it's on both of them at the same time. The first reason was because the design was too bland. It felt like I was looking at a game that looked exactly like the newest Call of Duty, and at the end, I don't even know what the hell that was. That was at the end some Ubisoft game. And I look at it, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This is the thing that I got wrong over another quote-unquote FPS, ultra-realistic shooter, yada, yada, yada. And that really upsets me. The second one is even more upsetting. And it's the fact that I could not see what our artistic style that was because I barely see games nowadays that have an art choice that is a bit out of there, that is a bit indie, that is indie, really. It's barely something that I see, see because of it. And I really can't understand how the hell can I get to this type of situation? I'm somebody who really is interested in games. I always try to search and I always try to find more and more of games that I really want to play. And my library always gets larger and larger. But sometimes I just find a game and, and something like Guess the Game. I see that it has a very distinctive art style. And I'm like, I don't know what this game is. And that's something that makes me really sad. Because nowadays indie games should rule they should be the better part because they don't matter for those rich people that need these shareholders those people that require these shareholders from companies and if they see that this company is doing bad that they're not going to give those shareholders so companies are going to do whatever they can to satisfy the customers and sorry 
I'm going to fix it. The rich customers, because that's what really matters here. Yeah. It doesn't matter if 10% of people, sorry, I'm going to fix it a bit. Okay. I'm just mad. And that's why I'm talking and gibberishing. Think about the fact that most companies are 90% of their revenue is 10% of people who are just so rich that they're giving their stocks. That means that 90% of people are the ones who are buying the game, playing, and enjoying it. Well, the 10% are the ones that are, well, giving them stock. They're giving them these fucking stupid shit, and you just need to be like, oh, yeah, this is what really matters. And it's sad because then you have companies that would do some really dumb shit. Like one example is Suicide Killed the Justice League. That they do things from not entirely their choice, not entirely their artistic choice. But this is what they did because that's what's going to give them stock shares. And because they did it, you could see a 90%, if not more, of people angry about the game and saying it's horrible. Not because that it didn't give them stock, not because that they lost money because the game was made this way, but because the game was genuinely bad and it was a cash grab. That's what people are mad about. It's something that happens way too much and I'm really sad to see it. At the end of the day, at the end of this story and finishing the book, you should not buy any AAA game. If you see a game with DLCs and it's and it's older then maybe 2020, don't buy the DLCs. They're not worth shit. Just go give Fallout New Vegas with its old DLCs. It's going to be much worth it and at least three times cheaper. I can promise you that personally. I'm recording this. There's the summer games. You can buy a shit ton of much better games. Much, much better games than what you can have from these years. Sure, there are a couple white horses that are actually good games, like Baldur's Gate is an example, and Helldivers 2. But still, there's still the very small number of AAA games that are really good, that most of it, that 95% of them are entirely shit, they're horrible things, and the rest are indie games. I learned in the game's rule, I should only buy them, because they deserve our support, they deserve it. If you can't support it, just go check what the creator of Ultra Kill said. And you should understand that at the end of the day, even if you buy it or not, you still support it. Either way, just don't buy triple A's. Thank you everybody for staying tuned and listening to my talking. I'll see you guys next time.